All right, so I'm gonna be reading a story um, that I published in the June 2019 Atlantic. Um, it's called Maria's Third Crossing and the deck reads, the first time she was raped, the second she nearly drowned. In order to live in the United States legally, she had to leave her family and attempt to cross the border once more. And uh, let's see, I pulled up a visual of Maria, but I don't know if you all can see it here. There she is. Anyway, that's her in a, the hotel room that we'll talk about later with her folder. Um, so what I'm gonna do, because it's a really long story, I'm going to read the first several paragraphs to kind of set the scene and then I'll skip forward with a little bit of explanation and then just hop to a scene in Mexico for a pet, the main, when we get to Mexico. All right, so Maria's third crossing. In January of last year, Maria called me to say she was going to Juarez. She had been living undocumented in the United States for 25 years, but now she was applying for permanent residency. The final step in the years long process could be done only at the US consulate in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. There, Luz Maria Zamora would stand across from a State Department employee with three stacks of papers, green, blue, and pink. If Maria received a green slip, she'd get a visa and return to her, her husband and children. Blue and she'd have to stay and collect missing paperwork. Pink and she would be stuck in Mexico until her extended family could pool enough money for a smuggler to bring her home. $8,000 to hide in the back of a vehicle, 15,000 if she wanted to sit in the passenger seat. Maria had only 30 days to come up with the money to travel to Juarez for her appointment. And from her voice on the phone, victorious, delirious, I could tell she had some kind of madcap plan. In fact, there had been a minor windfall. A cow had slipped in the mud and broken its leg and its owner had asked Maria and her husband to end its suffering and salvage the meat. They went around the house and found $9 in coins, filled the truck with some gas and drove out to the farm. Robert put the animal down and they dressed it in the pasture. Now Maria was turning 80 pounds of beef into jerky to sell by the bag. I told Maria I would go with her to Juarez. I'd been following her story for a few years and I wanted to be there to see how it turned out. I was as strapped as she was, but I returned to the Ozarks where I was born and finally got around to selling for parts the Volkswagen Passat with a blown water pump that someone had left to my mother and whose title had somehow been signed over to me. I first met Maria in 2014 during my trips and spoke in a rapture of the woman he had come to think of as his 10th child, though they shared no actual blood. He of course my internet would go out as soon as I started speaking. Anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, you guys, but I'm um, all good. All right, so let's see where I was. Um, my dad is drinking beer in a wood pile. I was talking about. Oh, all right, so my parents had met Maria and her five children through her husband Robert, a third generation Mexican American who was working in the area. Investigation, murder investigation, where are you with that? Question. Maria had grown up in rural Mexico and she and Robert wanted to go back to the land in the Ozarks. My mom and dad decided to sell them a few acres of their property and a zero interest loan. Maria and Robert named the place El Rancho. I should roll the R, but and beginning and began filling it with geese, mules, and a split rail pin of pigs. They planned to build a cabin there. Meanwhile, they rented an apartment in nearby Springdale, a cow town when I was a kid, best known for its annual rodeo, that has grown into a small city with the arrival of Latino Marshallese immigrants. The big businesses in Northwest Arkansas, industrial chicken farms, Walmart, construction, depend on these newcomers for labor. 
Maria's husband and children are born and raised Americans, but she lacked a social security number and was forbidden to work. In truth, she worked circles around everyone, keeping the apartment spotless and her kids in new clothes, doing anything from building fences to cleaning houses for cash. When her daughter needed $400 for a French horn and a band trip, she raised the money by selling homemade salsa. Maria never knew her real father, but my dad began calling her hija, daughter. She called my parents padre and madre. Among my eight brothers and sisters, I'd always drifted near the bottom of the pecking order. Maria zoomed to the top. I was surprised to learn that my parents had bragged to her about me, said we were alike, gutsy. But whereas I'd always been deemed rebellious and mouthy, she was independent, direct. Maria and her family around. But I was furious when I found out she and Robert were two years behind in their payments for El, Ran El Rancho. They seemed more likely to inherit the property than pay it off. Only one of my siblings has, has been deeded land, the sole thing of value my parents possess. Maria's uncle had once mocked her for trying to learn English. It meant the world to her when my father, who long ago had taught Spanish at universities. A professor, she told people, praised her fluency. When I attempted to speak Spanish, she cheered on my efforts. But when I began to understand a lot, I sensed that she felt I'd poached something special of hers. She's smart, I once heard her say to friends, her tone unmistakably rueful. She'll learn quickly. All right, so there, there we are. And um, from there, we get head to Juarez with her 20 something year old son. It's not a big part of the story. He spent a lot of the time in the hotel room, which is totally fine. Um, and the next passage is I'm explaining some, the legal process that she's going through, the visa um, that she's applying for. And it was, it took four years. And the remarkable thing is that she did it without a lawyer because she couldn't afford a good one. And, um, and joined this Facebook group 36,000 people and just through the advice of people in this group filed and collected all the papers herself. Um, a centerpiece, the centerpiece of this whole story is actually, in her words, um, oral histories that I collected from her of her two border crossings. Um, one when she was 15 and um, she was she and two friends were kidnapped and assaulted for around a month and she had two children in the United States went back to Mexico and then crossed again um, this time over the Rio Grande um, to get back to the state so that she could get med medical care for one of her sons because they were US citizens I wouldn't be able to read those aloud. They're so difficult, but they're, they're ugly, awful stories, but beautifully told. And if you don't, I don't have to read the essay, but I definitely would read the, I would say definitely read these oral histories. Um, and so from there, I'm just going to skip to Mexico. And I, the only thing that you will probably need to know going into it is that we'll refer to her son, Eliseo, who he was, um, and his, he was a teenager and he died the summer that I was collecting these oral histories in a car accident. And so she refers to him because she, she talks about him a lot and that's how she's um, getting through that. <clears throat> in Juarez, an industry of hotels, restaurants and fixers has sprung up around the US consulate. The only one in Mexico that processes immigrant visa applications. Maria, Joaquin, and I decamped to the Conquistador Inn to wait for her appointments. The medical exam conducted at a private facility would be the first and more difficult of her two interviews. Members of the Facebook group had told her what questions she would have to answer, which they believed are meant to trip up applicants, masking judgments of character as medical assessments. Tattoos, what do they mean? DUI, so you have a drinking problem? Maria would have to confess to tattooed eyebrows and share the butterfly on her lower back. 
hardly gang symbols, but everyone was nervous about everything. She'd gotten a checkpoint DUI seven years earlier when she'd had be a beer at home before a friend at a party drunk called for a ride. And what would the antidepressant prescribed after LSAO died mean? Inside the facility, she and other women received barcoded bracelets and took off their clothes. Then technicians x-rayed their lungs to check for tuberculosis. Children, five. Natural births or C-sections? Natural births, she answered, but they checked her abdomen for a scar. The tattoos and the DUI were discussed and dismissed and a psychiatrist determined that she was grieving, not mentally ill. Maria received a, a sealed plastic envelope to give to her consulate interviewer. On the way out, she studied the bill. The cost of the exam was $220. The facility had not accepted proof of her previous vaccinations and had administered its own, bringing the total to 445. Over the next few days, a group coalesced in the conquistadors lobby where a holiday atmosphere sprang up as it does in places of purgatorial crisis. Miguel had been stuck in Mexico for five months. An x-ray had showed a spot on his lung, so he would have to pass a series of sputum tests before going home. In California, he was a diesel mechanic. He found a job in Tijuana while he waited, but it didn't cover the mortgage and bills. He and his wife, Blanca, have two young children, and her uncle gave her gas money so they could drive to, to Tijuana on weekends and see Miguel. Yavna and her sister Graciela, 14 years her junior, confounded everyone. Yavna was the US citizen of the two, but strangers assumed the opposite since she was brown skinned and her sister fair. Yavna's parents had divorced soon after she was born in the US. Her father had then returned to Mexico and had Graciela with a light skinned, hazel eyed woman. He took Graciela north when she was three. Yavna, now a dental assistant, had helped their father buy Rite Aid gift cards for birthdays and otherwise raised her sister. Graciela has her own small children. She'd put off applying for residency because she was afraid to leave them. Why apply now? Because of the president we have. A few days into our stay, Miguel walked into the conquistadors lobby holding a green slip. People passed the paper around, rubbing it for luck. Miguel sat on a sofa and shook his head. Creo en Dios. I believe in God. Tall, radiant Annabella rushed in the next morning. Her visa had been approved. She spread pictures of her grandchildren on the table and gossiped with Maria. She worried that Maria's two crossings would disqualify her. Most of our group in the hotel had appointments on the same day. And the night before, everyone who gathered in the lobby agreed to go over together. Miguel and his wife Blanca were there and Yavana and Graciela. Claudia sat next to her husband, their hands on each other's knees. Oscar showed us a video on his phone of a massive rave he DJ'd once a year. He'd moved to Brooklyn 10 years ago. His plan had been to save some money and then come back to Mexico and open a business. But he had a baby. Maria rose to hold court, speaking in Spanish telling the folks from California and New York about her garden harvest at El Rancho, the tomatoes, onions, and chilies she made into salsa. It's very rare that I shop at Walmart, she boasted. On her phone, she pulled up a picture of a black bear, and there are dangerous cougars. She was a jaunty country girl in a checkered work shirt, spooking the city slickers as my brothers and sisters and I used to do. I'd never felt closer to her. Blanca wondered about the Latino population in Arkansas, jobs, the presence of ice. Maria talked about her house cleaning. For the men, it's easier. They work in construction and explained that in Elkins, most of the locals have been welcoming. Is it a sanctuary city? Yavna asked. No. The rumor was that in practice, appointments were first come, first served. So the next morning, everyone lined up at the consulate before dawn, buying coffee at a corner store. <coughs> Excuse me. A young man passed around almond cake. Once the consulate opened, 
Those with appointments went inside while the others waited. Francisco was agitated. He's a naturalized citizen and works for $13 an hour at a plant in Texas that makes aluminum rotors. Their hot edges had burned a ladder of scars up his arms. Now his parents were seeking to join him. He believed his father would be okay. He had crossed illegally but returned 12 years ago. His mother had never crossed, but she couldn't read or write. Would she get rattled? Could she remember the dates of birth for her many children if asked? He'd written them on a, on a scrap of paper and tucked it in her hand. We were in desert weather, our feet freezing on the ground, our head and shoulders roasting as the sun rose. A line formed behind us, eventually stretching a couple of blocks. There was a stir in the crowd. Our people were coming out. Claudia fell into her husband's arms, her cheeks wet with, wet with tears. Approved. Graciela found her sister and smiled for what seemed like the first time in days. I can go back to my children now. Oscar and the man who'd shared his almond cake disappeared. We heard they'd gotten blue slips. Francisco's parents walked up, stiff and formal, but with victory in their eyes. Francisco raised a singed arm straight to heaven. Gracias a Dios, he called, loud enough for Dios to hear. Maria came out and found Joaquin. She had a green slip in her hand. And just so you know, the guys who got blue slips, they ended up being okay. They got to come back. I found out later in the fact-checking process because we tracked down all these folks and talked to them again, saw how they were doing. All right, a couple more paragraphs. I'm out of here. Maria would wait in her family's home in Jalisco, farther south, for DHL to deliver her visa. Her aunt had died a few months before, and her uncle owed alone, a handyman, solemn with grief, lived there with his grown sons and their children. He picked us up at the airport in Guadalajara. Maria had not been to her Pueblo in 20 years. It lies at the foot of a mountain, and a vandalized Spanish hacienda stands at the edge, its interior blue walls open to the sky. Villagers maintain the cobblestone streets. Men working in construction in the States have wired money to have the icons in the chapel leafed in gold and a man named Alejandro rings its bell with a rope. For a few pesos, an old couple will milk one of their cows directly into your pail. About 4,000 Mexicans live in the Pueblo, along with a few hundred migrants from El Salvador and Guatemala who come there to pick the blackberries and raspberries surrounding the town. Most Mexicans couldn't get by on the wages. The first night, there was tequila and Coca-Cola under the Bougainvillea Maria's grandmother had planted decades ago. Her cousins and their families filtered in, piling drinks and tacos on the card table before her and pulling up chairs. A delivery man brought Coronas in a bucket filled with ice and then cracked one open himself and sat down. The younger men talked trash. Maria sassed back, giving as good as she got, and they screamed with laughter. Past midnight, the children put themselves to bed and a cousin turned the radio from mariachi music to something slower. Odilon took Maria's hand and she rested her head on his shoulder as they danced. In the morning, Maria brought duffels of her children's hand-me-downs to her childhood best friend, Anna. The women sorted through the pile just as they had in 1997 when Maria gave all her clothes to Anna before heading to the Rio Grande. Over the next few days, Maria walked through the streets, greeting people. Me recuerdas? Do you remember me? She bought snacks sold in a doorway and an old woman stepped out. Do you remember me? I'm Maria. Maria, I remember those eyes. My son at Eliseo died in an accident. I'm in Arkansas. Remember how I used to take you from your mother when she was beating you? Yes. Maria walked on. There was the guava tree. There was the clinic where her little brother Alfonso was born. There are the sheep, so big. See that cactus over there? 
it produces fruit, but only in May. Uh, pinche madre, motherfucker, she crooned. 